All right, Revelation chapter 19. Um, let's just back up for a moment and think about this section of Revelation. We began in chapter 12. We were introduced to the woman and one other figure that was really prominent in chapter 12. Who recalls that other figure? The enemy of the woman and her child. What's that? Yeah, the dragon. You get to chapter 13, and what characters are introduced? Beast. Beast. Beast of... Yeah, the water of the sea, uh, representing Imperial Rome, probably representing the emperor himself. Uh, and then the beast of the earth, representing what? Anybody remember? Six, six, six. Well, the mark of the beast is 666. The beast of the earth represents that imperial cult that enforced the emperor worship to worship the first beast. And it's just simply giving us in these signs and symbols what was unfolding in the first century and particularly in the first century Asia Minor as he's writing this letter to the seven churches of Asia, we want to remember, of course, that these things had primary application to them. And they would have had a more instinctive understanding of what he's writing about because they were living through it. And they had witnessed these things. Um, so we have these various characters that are being, or that were introduced in chapter 19, it's kind of wrapping up um, the beast, the false prophet. And then as we go further in the book, it's going to get to this idea of the, um, the dragon himself being defeated and conquered. So you, you have these various things that are introduced in very um, fantastic language, if you will, very descriptive language. But they have very practical applications in the life of the people who receive this letter. So let's notice here in chapter 19, let's read verses 1 through 10 to begin with. Revelation 19, 1 through 10. Who will grab that for us? Philip. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude of heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with the fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of the servant shed by her. Again they said, Alleluia, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all you, all you his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. And let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. To her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell and I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant, and your brethren, who have dead who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Okay. All right, so question one I had asked, who rejoiced over the judgment of the harlot? The harlot, of course, being introduced back in chapter 17. Now it talks about that this judgment is coming against her, and then there's a rejoicing. So who is it that's doing the rejoicing there? A multitude. Okay, the great multitudes. Okay, they're true and righteous in verse 4. 
Yeah, 24 elders and the four living creatures are joined in with that. You recall that we were introduced to them back early in the book and how that they were around the throne of God and praising God. Uh, you have in chapter 7 the marking out of the 144,000 who were faithful to God. Um, then right after that you have this great multitude that's praising God in heaven. You know, there's the description uh, even later about this great multitude, uh, those who were not defiled with women and whom was no deceit, they, they were there praising God. And so here's this heavenly body of, of various ones, whether it's the 24 elders, or it's the four living creatures, or this great multitude, those who have been faithful to God, that they are there at this time rejoicing over the fact that this harlot has been judged. And let's just remind ourselves the harlot represents what? Okay, there's Babylon. She's also described as Babylon. Rome from what perspective? What elements? Because remember, all through this, these, these various elements, the, the beast of the sea, there's a it's Rome, but it's a very specific aspect of Rome. The, the emperors are the emperor. You've got the political power there. You have the beast of the earth that represents the religious power in Rome with the emperor cult and it being enforced. Then the harlot, Philip? The harlot, the, the culture of Rome. Yeah, exactly. The culture, the, the immorality that was there. Um, because it keeps talking about the wine uh, of her fornication. She seduced the kings to commit fornication. Um, so there is this moral compromise that the harlot represents. And so it's saying here that that immorality in Rome and that culture is being judged by God. And these people are rejoicing over that. Verse 2, the great harlot corrupted the earth with her fornication. And what else did she do? <coughs> Latter part of two. Of what was she guilty? Shedding her blood. Yeah, shedding her blood. So that, it, it's interesting that you've got the, the political power, the religious power, the culture power, all coming together to go against the people of God because they didn't go along with it. And so they're being attacked from all sides, if you will, and this harlot now is being judged. Um, now, how could a God of love judge these people? You know, our culture says that God is a God of love and He accepts everybody. We have a huge push now that everybody, you know, Jesus wouldn't do that. And when they say that, Jesus wouldn't judge someone, Jesus wouldn't condemn someone, Jesus didn't do those things. But here we see God judging this immoral culture. So how can a God of love do that? He's and you can't have one way for one set of people and another for another set. It has to be one. Okay. Really yeah, one standard and he molds people to that standard. Any other thoughts? Philip? He's a God of love, but he's also a just God. I mean, but he shows us his love by I mean, not sending Jesus to die on the cross um, to give us a path to heaven. Uh, but he also gave us free will, so it's our choice whether or not to follow that path. I mean, just, be, just because he, I mean, he's a just God, he's a wrathful God as well, but he's also a God of love. Just because he is a wrathful God and uh, he calls down judgment on those, uh, on, this, on this nation because they, they chose not to follow his will, that doesn't mean he's not a God of love. He gave them ample opportunity to turn, but his patience has an end to something. Yeah, hey. We just look at the history that God had with Israel. He was the God of, he loved Israel. But he sent them 
all the judges for them to correct their ways. Once they get correct their ways, he sent them into captivity. Right. It, just look at his history and it will show you he is a righteous guy, but I'll tell the judges. Yes. Yes. Any other thoughts, Chris? We love him. We truly follow his commandments. If we love him, yeah. We'll follow him. That's the way the, the world today said their version of love. The word says we love him. We truly follow his commandments. Mm -hmm. Philip. Look at the, the parent child relationship that we have. We, we love our children, and they do something, they get out of line, we punish them. Does that mean that we don't love them because we punish them? No. I mean that we punish them because we love them, because we want to set them on the right path. And, and, and you, you have to kind of translate that to God is our Father and we're His children. So if He loves us, He'll punish us if we get out of line. And that's what He's, I mean, He's calling down punishment on a nation that's gotten out of line. Right. How, how, you, can't, how you can say that that's not love, well, I can't even yeah. So a couple of things. One is God is holy, as Ashley said, He has a standard. Now, how would we view God if He compromised His own standard? How to Philip's illustration, how do children view parents who compromise their own standard? You, know, you lose respect. In the workplace, if you if you have you know, the, the boss, the manager, the owner, whoever, has a policy and then they compromise that. What does that do f for everyone who works for them? It, it's just disrespect. It breeds that disrespect. But if they hold to it, even if it's strict, even if it's stern, there's respect that's built up. Okay, this person is just, they're fair. You know, they're, they're, they're hard-nosed, but but they're going to treat you right according to what the clear standard is. And you do that too, another thing I think about is you lose any influence that you have. Right. We compromise the truth. We lose any influence that we have. Say that's like you say, you say your children and also in the workplace. If you do that, you compromise, you lose any influence that you might have. Yeah, yeah, it's very damaging. So, also, I want us to think about in this case, who, when it talks about the harlot, it, it is talking about that, that sort of um, metaphorical idea of this is a culture that is corrupt. But there were people involved in that culture. And earlier in the book, remember, it talked about that a third of these people were punished, and these people were punished, and these people... In chapter 9, or 18, it, it talks about this um, judgment coming against Rome. These people who are weeping because it's affecting them and all of that. But ultimately, when you talk about the beast of the sea, when you talk about the beast of the earth, when you talk about the harlot, we need to understand they are enemies of God. Enemies to God. And those enemies have to be overcome. They have to be defeated. Um, and anybody who's caught up in a false religion, anybody who's caught up in immorality, is an enemy of God. There's just no other way about that. Remember in James chapter 2, or rather James chapter 4, how that James had put it this way in James 4, as he was asking questions about the issues they were having in James 4, verse 4, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And so these people in Rome were enemies of God. Anybody today who is caught up in false religion is an enemy of God. That's true if they are a Muslim or a Hindu or a Buddhist or if they're caught up in humanism and atheism, which is a religion, or they're caught up in denominationalism. They are enemies of God. And they will be punishing God as just for punishing them. Any other thoughts there? Alright then. Uh, what is it that they say about the judgments of God?
can they view his judgments? Right, wrong? True and righteous. True and righteous all together. Um, now then, question number two. Question number two. In light of this, how should we react to the fall of a corrupt nation? When it's talking about this harlot's being judged, how should we react to the fall of a corrupt nation? Verse 7 would probably cover that. Okay. And what... How's that? Let us be glad and rejoice. Okay. And it goes on to talk there about the marriage of the bride and the groom, the lamb and the bride, but you know, it talks about Alleluia, Amen. By the way, what is Alleluia? Praise the Lord. Play, praise Jehovah. Um, that's what it's saying. So how do we react? Okay, rejoicing in his victory. Any other thoughts there? That's good. However you express however you want to express that, that's great. That's good. We'll, we'll go along with that. Did did the Saints in Asia Minor face difficulties because of the collapse of Rome? When these judgments come against Rome, if they are a part of Rome, it would affect them. When judgments come against our nation, it affects Christians in the nation. But we need to we need to work to have the biblical perspective on things versus our own personal perspective. Um, and sometimes that's difficult to do, to separate the two out. Do you remember when Jesus in Matthew chapter 16 told his disciples that he he would be tried by the Jews, the elders of the Jews, he would, you know, the third he would be crucified and all of that, and how Peter reacted to it? You ready to remember what Peter did when the Lord was telling about his death that was impending? Yeah. He, Peter stood up and said, it's not going to happen. I'm not going to allow it. Have the Lord react to Peter. Yeah, get behind me, Satan. You're telling him you're thinking as a man thinks and not as God thinks. We have, we have to work really hard to have that perspective of God. There may be things that happen in our nation that are very painful, um, not only to us, but to people we love, and things may fall apart one day, completely apart. I mean, they're falling apart now, but completely fall apart. And we need to be careful and step back and realize it, it very well could be the hand of God bringing judgment against this nation for all the immorality, for the murder of babies, for all kinds of things, for turning against people who stand for biblical principles. You know, that may be happening. So we want to be careful about our perspective on how these things unfold or what is unfolding. Any other thoughts thus far? First few verses here, Mike. Yeah, I was just thinking that, you know, as we kind of go through the transition of this uh, wrath that God's pouring out, of course, we're going to have sacrifices in our own lives and stuff like that. But if, we're, if we understand that bigger picture, people see that, they're more likely to go, okay, so what's different in his life than his mind? Right, exactly. So it opens up an opportunity for others to be able to follow God if, we don't, if we're not panicking like everyone else is. Right, and that's really uh, part of that emphasis at the beginning of the book, saying remain true and faithful. It was for them to receive that crown of life, but they then act as that light in that darkened culture as things are falling apart, and you're exactly right. It attracts others. Uh, those with a good heart will be like, that's what I want. I can see this clearly now. So in a way, it's really good. The faster culture declines, the quicker there's a clear separation between the righteous and the unrighteous. Uh, but be that as it may, I think it's interesting when you see here chapter 18, 
when Babylon is fallen, and it talks about Babylon being fallen, and all these different ones, the kings, the merchants of the earth, and all these people are mourning over that. In chapter 19, you have the saints, or you have the servants of God rejoicing over that. Very stark contrast there. All right, so God is also praised for the marriage uh, of the Lamb. The marriage of the Lamb and being praised again and again. Now, in chapter 19, we want to understand that this is... It is talking about the marriage of the Lamb has come, but it's not actually fulfilled until you get over to chapter 21, when it talks about the bride the, the, uh, of the Lamb coming down and being joined to Him. So that fulfillment is actually going to be a little bit later. But when it's talking about this bride, when it's talking about this marriage, what's it referring to? Church. Right, exactly. Again and again, in the New Testament, and really going back to the Old Testament, referred to God's people as being the bride. And what do we talk about that? What's, what's that representative of, or what does that imply? The bride. Yes, a bride to the Lamb, or a bride to Christ. The church. Yes, the church. What, what kind of relationship is that? What's... In subjection to Him, devoted to Him, in a covenant with Him. Um, what's that? Loving. Loving Him. Faithful to Him. That's the, the thing I see a lot is the idea of uh, being an adulterous, spiritual adulterer, which is committed by people that are going against Christ. Those who are in the church that go astray, they're committing spiritual adultery. So, right, that's kind of that thought kind of plays in my mind. Exactly. When, whenever someone says, I know the Bible says, but I think that right there is rebellion against Christ. It's spiritual adultery, as Rick is talking about. They have not been faithful to Him. I know it says, but that's an issue. That's a problem. So, thinking about that, thinking about the marriage of the Lamb, how that we are betrothed to Christ now, there is that marriage and that marriage feast that is coming, uh, and we're blessed to be called to that supper. We need to be mindful of how privileged we are to be a Christian and to do God's will to live for Him day in and day out. And, you know, some people have, some people in their marriage relationship, they, let me ask you this, put it this way. How is it sometimes referred to the, the wife relative to the husband? It's said jokingly. It should not be said at all, but I'm, I'm just going to say I'm not sure how to describe it. The old ball and chain. That's how some men view their wife. The ball and chain. What does that imply? They're out. Holding them down. Holding them down. Holding them back. Just it's restricted, right? <laughs> What, what did God design the marriage relationship for? We're on a little detour, but we're going to come right back in to help her. It's to be mutually beneficial for each other, right? They each have a role. And yes, there are rules that govern that relationship. You can't just go do whatever you want to do. You have responsibilities here. But it's to be a blessing, a privilege. It's the very foundation of a society. And when that breaks down, the society breaks down, as we obviously see. But the thing is, yes, we being a part of the bride of Christ brings rules, brings restrictions, if you will, but they're designed for our benefit. They're designed for our good. And there's a great blessing within that. And so we need to appreciate that relationship we have with Him and look forward to this time, as it talks about here, about the marriage of the Lamb, how there's going to be that great wedding feast. All right, any other thoughts down through about verse 9 so far? 
probably could look at the Cadillac company. You know, um, when you're military, you take some kind of hose, play in the lake, and police officers, they take a hose, you know. But being a Christian, it's kind of the same way. You have a post of office or an oath of marriage, and it requires it requires certain things, and you have to live by them. Exactly. When we believe, repent, confess, and are baptized, we've made a pledge of allegiance to Christ. Amen. Exactly. Exactly right. Very good. All right. Question number three. I ask for what. Was John admonished, and what implication does this have on Jehovah's Witness doctrine regarding the nature of Jesus? So verse 10 says, as he sees this angel there, he fell at his feet to worship him. And how did the angel react to that? See that you do not do that. Don't do that. Why? I'm a servant. He's a servant. Servant, and he's not? He's not one to be praised. Yeah, he's not God. Something that just jumped out in this passage to me when I was going through it this time is the fact of your brother. Mm -hmm. So think about angels being our brother. <laughs> That's just kind of a side point, but it, it jumped out. Hey, yeah, he, he talks about I, I'm your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus worship God. Uh, what does Hebrews chapter 1 teach about angels? Anybody remember the end of Hebrews 1? Minister of spirits. Send forth to do what? Minister for those who will inherit salvation. Who, who do they minister to? Us. To us. Yeah. They're fellow servants, but their specific role, as it talks about there, or at least one of the things they function as, is ministering servants to us. So we don't worship them. We worship God. And, of course, what's the Jehovah's Witness doctrine about Jesus? Do what? Okay, then he's Michael the Archangel. Exactly right. They, they don't see Jesus as deity. They see him as an angel. So... This here destroys that idea that Jesus is an angel that can be worshipped. Because the Bible demands worship of Christ. We worship Him. We honor Him. Alright, any other thoughts there? Alright, let's read verses 11. I tell you what, let's do 11 through 16 to start with. 11 to 16. Who will grab that for us? Zach. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had an apron in that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress with the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Alright. So, he turns, he sees him who sat on it, faithful, true, righteous, judges and makes war. And what's he sitting on? Verse 11. White horse. Uh, very often in first century Rome, when the generals returned, they had their parades, you know, that they had a victory parade, that they made this great defeat of their enemy. They would ride on a white horse. And that's the idea here. He's, he's riding in victory. He's, he's triumph over his enemies. Um, I asked you in question four to list the names given to the one on the white horse and briefly explain them. So let's just step through these one by one. What's the first designation there in 11? 
Faithful and true. What's the idea there? What is it relative to Christ that he's faithful? He did his father's commands. He followed his will, right? Anything else? Could this be a connection to the Laodiceans? Only because the phrase faithful and true is said uh, in, in the context of chapter 3, verse 14, the end of the church of the Laodiceans, right? Jesus thinks says the amen, the faithful and true witness. Or yeah, it's, it's an answer. No, it's it's him. It's a, it identified him before as faithful and true, and again it's identifying him as faithful and true. Uh, that this is a message from Christ to the church at Laodicea, and here we see that same one who is victorious. So the same one who's giving them the message and telling them here's how you need to live is the same one that's victorious in the end. So if you want to be on his side, you need to live. Paul, do you have something? Well. It, the change is not would be applied here to people. Okay. If what he said wasn't here. Right. It's, he's faithful to us as well. He's faithful to God. He's also faithful to us. We can rely on him. As Paul's saying, he's steadfast, he's constant. He doesn't change. We we can rely on Christ. So he's faithful and he's true. Any other any other ideas about truth? I am the way the truth and the life. He is the embodiment of truth. That is his nature. That is who Christ is. He speaks the truth. He requires the truth. So faithful and true. What else does it say of him? How does he make war? Verse 11. Okay. Um, when people talk about Christianity and they talk about Christ, in our culture, typically how do they see Him? Let me ask you this. When you see some artist rendition of Christ, almost always, what's, what's the picture of Him? How does that appear? Soft, uh, meek. Uh, Soft, meek. Now, he certainly is meek. But it's not this <laughs> snowflake that they were talking about. Okay, snowflake. Like, uh, they want to demonize him, I think. He's most definitely been feminized. The soft features, the, the rosy cheeks, the, the glow that's around him. Um, the, you know, they, they have Christ essentially as appear as a feminized hippie. It's the way they see him. Here, you see a very manly, conquering warrior. It says he makes war. Right? In the New Testament, it talks about being soldiers of Christ and the implements of a soldier. We have to understand we are at war. Our leader is at war. Now, that doesn't take away compassion, love, grace, mercy. It doesn't take away any of that. Kindness, gentleness. Christ is gentle to those who submit to Him. But those who rebel, he brings that rod of iron as it talks about here. He brings the sword of the mouth against them. And we have to recognize that we, in following him, are in that same war. And we need to do it righteously. In righteousness, he judges and makes war. It's not my opinion, it's not my feelings how that I talk to people or react to people. So what does the Word of God say? Let that Word do its job and be effective. Joe. Sure. Okay. In the Renaissance, look at it, especially in the Middle Ages, when they, when they painted Christ with long hair, I don't think it was to feminize him in that respect because 
come back down a lot of them will not come back. You know, and they will be here and you know, so in that sense now I don't know about the new modern stuff, but I think it's in the old days it wasn't it did well, the push that Right. It's not necessarily the long hair that feminizes him. It's it's the rosy cheeks, the very softness. You know, the, the way that they depict him and then the way that they talk about him. Um, you know, today, there, there's a huge thing in our culture. I mean, if you, if you know anything about denominational churches and how they view Christ, they, they view him, um, well, it's not biblically. It's one-dimensional is how they view Yes. They yes. only view one part of who he is. And you know, and I always kind of look at it this way. Whenever you go to some of the um, denominations that may have a statue of Christ on the cross that's got like this little trickle of blood, it would have been a bloody mess right. on that cross. But it's depicted in something so far different than what was actually happening. And you know, it's the same way with our traditions today. They are trying to picture one dimension of him and leave all the rest of it out. Right. The parts I don't really care for. Right, right. Um, it, it's the overall picture of Christianity has, has been softened. And that is not the picture we get in the New Testament. In the New Testament, I mean, you just read through the book of Acts. You look at Paul and what he went through. He was, he was rugged. And it's not to say that we are all um, brute beasts or wild people. That's, that's not the picture at all. But I mean, this is what you would think of as, you know, Paul was a manly man. And he stood up for what was right. He, he wasn't this soft, feminized version that's being pushed on us in our culture. And there's a reason for that. The reason for that is they want to overlook sin. They don't want the conflict but we're reading here in this book, there's conflict. And we can't shy away from that. There's going to be conflict between the bride and the world. The two don't harmonize together. And there's no avoiding that. Um, so here, though, the picture of Christ is, He is this great warrior that's sitting on this white horse, and He judges and He makes war as He goes out. And it talks about the crowns that he's wearing on his head. And these are the victory crowns. He's defeated many enemies. And he has his name written on his leg. Um, it's got the name there in verse 16, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But he also has this name that only he himself knows. So there's, we have an inability to fully grasp the Christ. There's, it's just giving us a hint. There's more here that we're just not able to understand. He knows it, but we don't. And the armies, verse 14, where are they? Heaven. Heaven. That means they're not where? On earth. On earth. Which means what? about popular theories. <coughs> What's that? It's a spiritual war. Yeah. You know, people get into this section of Revelation and some of the stuff before they talk about this. Battle of Armageddon. It's going to take place over in the Middle East. And, you know, it's Saddam Hussein. Well, it's whoever. You know, of course, he's gone now. But they'll, they'll pick another person. They'll say, well, there's this great battle that's going to take place over there. And they believe it's an earthly battle. Well, here's very clear. No, these are heavenly armies. This is spiritual warfare. This is not earthly warfare that is taking place. So, it's a spiritual war. Um, any other thoughts down through about 15 or so? Got a couple more things to cover here. Alright. Let's read verses 17 to 21, please. Revelation 19, 17 to 21. Who will grab that for us? Wow. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in the mid heaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders, 
and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized, and with him was the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Okay. So, uh, question five I'd ask, what is the picture described here and what's ironic about it relative to chapter 16? Can anybody remember chapter 16 and what, what was being described there? Okay, the bowls of wrath that were there. And in verses 12 to 16, back in chapter 16, you've got this, the river Euphrates being pictured there. The waters are dried up. The way the kings from the east might be prepared. Spirits like frogs coming out of the dragon, of the beast, the false prophets. Spirits of demons performing signs. And they gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Now, in chapter 19, it's wrapping this up. And maybe my question was too cryptic, but Bonnie's giving me like, yeah. <laughs> um, what would you normally expect to read? Uh, anybody here student of military history? Okay, read some military history. Okay. If you ever read military history, very often they'll go back and they'll start tracing like the opposing commanders or maybe just one commander's history, okay? They, they kind of started out here. They might give a very brief bio of their very young life, but then they'll talk about, okay, they, they entered into the military here and here's kind of the experiences they had and then, you know, it'll get up and then they'll, they'll spend a lot of time describing what's leading up to this battle. And then when they describe the battle, what do they do? Well, they, they had this many horsemen. You know, they, they, they had this many foot soldiers. They, they had this many spearmen or bowmen. And they lined up in three groups or six groups or how many ever it is. And the enemy took the first action. and. Man, it'll just give details about all these things that unfold in that battle, and that battle may last a day, or it might last three days, or whatever it is, but they will go into immense detail about that. And some of those things are very fascinating. What's being described here? They lost. They lost. That's it. So, how does that strike you? It was not much of a fight. Exactly right. But it is... Let's elaborate on that. Is there a very real battle and war that's taking place right now? Yes. 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 Is it brutal? Yes. Yeah. It is brutal. Right? Souls of men and women are at stake. And the devil is absolutely ruthless and relentless in pursuing us. Right? It's bad. So what's the picture being given here? Complete victory. Complete victory. They're going to be totally and wholly defeated. I mean, again, you go back to those battles in history and you read about them and while the other side may be conquered well they, they may have another you know portion of their army over here they're still in the fight they're still going at it and you know even with Rome when they went in they conquered a territory if they went and conquered Gaul what what rule is Gaul under today anybody know France France they're not Romans they're not Italians right so while they conquered, they conquered temporarily. It was tenuous. 
you know, but there came a time they threw that off. Here, it's utter and complete defeat. That's it. It's over. That's what's being pictured for us. <laughs> Any other thoughts on that? Just a simple thought there with that fact being the primary focus of this. It gives more comfort. You don't have to deal with the thoughts of all of the struggles that are going on with it. I guess it, it actually gives you more comfort in knowing the whole thing will be good for this. Yeah. Okay. All right. Rick's talking about it. it gives us comfort knowing this is the outcome. <clears throat> You know, at the servant side of the world, it's all the chariots and hilltops. I mean, that pretty much was like, uh, there is no battle here, there is the instance of it. Right. I mean, you know, how you're dealing with something that you're working to see, they were on their side. Right, exactly right. Talking about the incident with Elisha and his servant and being surrounded by the Syrian army, then he prayed for the servant's eyes to be opened up, and he saw the chariots of fire and, and the army of God around them there. Um, and that just shows, look, our side is victorious. Now, here's what I want us to think about. There are decisions we make in life that we second guess. Did I make the right decision? Sometimes if you get a job or if you change jobs, like, hmm, I'm not sure if I made the right decision here. Um, buying a car, buying a house, all kinds of things. I'm just, sometimes you have those doubts about, I'm not sure if I made the right decision, and the reason we doubt if we made the right decision is we don't know what the outcome is yet. We don't know what's going to unfold. There's some things along the way that are kind of making us realize, well, this isn't exactly what I expected it to be and all that. Now, when you become a child of God, there's no way you can know everything that you're going to experience or go through. But what do you know? Victory in the end. Victory. There's no question. It's going to turn out right and good. So there's no reason for us to doubt our decision to become a child of God. There's no reason to question, well, you know, should I do this? Should I not do this? Because here's the end. We will be on his side. Joe, do you have something else? <clears throat> Rebecca? Um, I was just thinking, the language in this matter reminds me of like when David fought Goliath. You have this big enemy that's like hugged up. They think they're going to win because they have this big beast out here to fight for them. And then they come out and they're like, no, you're going to be eaten by the birds of the field. And, I mean, birds of the air. And, mm -hmm. and then it's just like over in an instant. Exactly. Just... One stone, he's done. Andrew. So, how to ask this for this part of Revelation? What's the battle that Zechariah 14 is talking about? What's that now? Zechariah 14, what it's talking about. So, it seems like the final battle that God comes down on the Mount of Olives and it splits. What's that talking about? Because a lot of people like to put it here. Well, I'll have to get back to you on Zechariah 14. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I just couldn't comment on that right now. Yeah. Um, we have this picture here, as Rebecca just brought up, that there's this battle, and then the beast and the birds come and feast on the flesh of the enemy that's been defeated. And it's very interesting that this is the great supper of God. The enemy is done away, and that picture of beasts eating these bodies that are in the field is to show in part a grotesque thing, but the, the defeat and the end of the enemies of God, we do not want to be on that receiving end. We want to be on that side that is victorious. Uh, they were delusional about being able to resist the Lamb of God, and now they are totally destroyed by the Lamb of God. Alright, so question six, and maybe we've already gone over this, stated a few different ways, but what's the overall message of chapter 19? Victory. God wins. Paul? Yeah, one other. Uh, verse 20, it says, uh, Mark the days and those who were in them were kept alive in the lake of 
on learning with grandson. That's so Right, the lake which burns the fire and brimstone is hell. That's where the beast and the false prophet are being thrown. Yes, that's where they will be punished eternally. Your life soul will be kept. Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you all very much. We're out of time. Joe. I mean, if you look at if you look at Acts chapter two, um, you know he said that this is which was this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and he goes into you know the sun shall be turned darkness, the moon and the blood, but that was I mean, he's saying this is a little bit referring to the day of cost, you know. So a lot of that is symbology of something else, you know, in the Old Testament. Yeah. A lot of people like to take this uh, that and say, you know, well, that literally means is that this is going to happen. Right. We can do this, you know. Yes. Yes. A lot of the Old Testament is pointing forward to the establishment of the kingdom. Uh, there would be some occasions where it's referring to God's final ultimate judgment. But you, you have to sort through that. Yeah. All right. Very good. Lord willing, we'll press on to Revelation next week.